Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 23. It's Matthew 24, I, don't, I knew that from the beginning. 23 is more like what we'll look at on 11 o'clock hour. In our uh, Sunday school class, there's a way as we're looking at the, the city of Jerusalem and Babylon going back and forth. Um, when you go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, what, well, what we pointed out last time is that associated with the city is the temple. And so one way of seeing the power of the city uh, coming and going is also to follow the movement of the temple. And, and one of the things I think is extremely important to see is that when you jump from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's as if there's, they're, they're connected. You know, if you know anything historically, they always say there's 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. And, uh, and, and the Lord does talk about a time that he's not going to speak to Israel, and, and that's the, the time where he wasn't until he raised up John the Baptist and he begins to speak again. But at the same time, when you read from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's like there's been no gap of time. You wouldn't know when, when you're reading unless you study from history, uh, or you pick up that verse that we read in, Matt, in John chapter 2 where it talked about where the Lord said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And they said, 40, 40 and 6 years has this temple been in building. Well, that verse would tell you, well, what happened to the temple that was in the Old Testament? Because when you end the Old Testament, Zerubbabel had come back after the 70 years of captivity and rebuilt the temple. Then you come to the New Testament and there's a temple there when Jesus Christ comes to earth. They don't rebuild anything. It's, it, it, they're still in the building process, but it, for the most part it's done. They're using it. There's sacrifices going on and everything. So you don't realize that that's a different temple than you ended with the Old Testament. And it doesn't make any difference. Because every temple that built is the temple of God, except for well, the Antichrist temple, as we'll, we'll see in today's study. Uh, because it's called the house of God. So it don't make any difference if Solomon built it, Zerubbabel built it, Herod, he didn't build it, he just he tried to please the Jews and, uh, and supported the building of the temple. Uh, so um, anyhow, you just, you just, it's, just, it's the temple, it's the house of God. Uh, when, you, when you do that connection though, when you see that, that there's that perfect blend in there, you'll see how Bible prophecies have two meanings. Because sometimes the things that are happening back here in Bible prophecy are going to be fulfilled in those days. And at the same time, they have a forecast that not only goes back to the first coming of Christ, but the second coming of Christ. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to build a temple. We'll ultimately get to that. And uh, so, so it's kind of unique how that Bible is written, that they just, it just blends together. And, and it's unique in the, also in the sense that that's kind of true about the age of grace. That when the dispensation of grace is over, uh, it'll just blend where the prophetic program left off. It'll just continue on. And I'll, I'll put the chart up in a moment and show you those things. But I want you to remember the temple. We're not so much worried about in the age of grace here uh, that the, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, although that is a very important doctrine and for, so for people to understand. So different from God's dealing with Israel. But... Uh, but when we come to Matthew 24, we had, we had Zerubbabel's temple being built. We, we saw that, and, and then we saw in, in Habakkuk, you remember there, uh, Haggai, um, where it says, the, the glory of the latter temple will be greater than the formal, former. So Zerubbabel's temple wasn't that fancy. Herod's temple must have been kind of fancy. Uh, Solomon's temple was, was magnificent. But... The Messiah, when he builds a temple, the glory of the latter temple uh, will be greater than the, than the former. And the former to Ezekiel was, was Solomon's temple. So um, as we're looking at those temples, the Lord Jesus Christ comes and in Matthew chapter 24, it says in verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. Now, if they're going to come and show him the building of the temple, he's been in that temple a bunch of times. <laughs> what it means to show him, they're really proud about this temple. This temple, you know, like it's probably greater than, than Zerubbabel had built. And, and so they're showing in the sense of showing off the temple. 
And verse 2 it says, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be, be left one here, one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. So they're, you know, they're, they're proud about the temple, and he immediately warns them, This temple's coming down. And, and the question comes th that we're going to be dealing with is, When is that? Uh, so verse 3 says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Now there is a, when you read this passage, it, this, it really he answers all those questions in this one chapter, but there's three questions there. Tell us, when shall these things be? When will the temple be destroyed? What shall be the sign of thy coming? So they understand he's going to go away and he's going to come back and the end of the world. And that end of the world is the end of the world system, the Gentile powers, Jesus Christ is going to set up His kingdom when He comes back. Those three things are tied together. At verse 2, uh, verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for there shall come and it, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see, uh, uh, see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. That's not the end of the world. So he's answering their question. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. This is how it all starts. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my namesake. And, uh, and then many... Uh, and then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many pro uh, false prophets shall arise and deceive many. It's a lot of deception. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that, endures, uh, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And the end of what? Well, they asked him, when's going to be the end of the world? The sign of thy coming and the end of the world. He's going to come and that's going to end that world system then. And, and so they're going, to have, they're going to have to endure to the end. They're not going to, they've got to make sure they're not deceived. Uh, and even though they're going to be betrayed by many and going to be killed, afflicted and killed as it says in verse 9. Uh, so verse 14. Now remember verse 8 said, these are the beginning of, sorrow, beginning of sorrows. Verse 14 it says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. By the way, we, we talk a lot of times just in the lobby about last days, and, and some people think that everything in the last days is going to center around the Middle East. And, uh, but you know, you read a verse like 14, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Wouldn't that cover all the way around the world? <laughs> And it says, then shall the end come. So the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached throughout the world before the end comes. Verse 15, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee in the mountains. Let him which are on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. So it's got to be, you're going to have to make a quick exit. Woe unto them that are with child, and them that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath, and then shall be great tribulation. Now you're not just in the beginning. That abomination of desolation, as we'll see in Daniel, is right in the middle of the last seven years. And then at those last seven years it becomes great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days be sorted. We can just keep reading on here, it's quite interesting. But I want you to, I want you to see that, that it all starts out them talking about this temple, the Lord saying it's going to be destroyed. They ask the question, when? And he starts describing the beginning of sorrows, and then verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. There's an abomination, and it's going to bring about a desolation. Well, they just, he would just told them the temple is going to be destroyed. And they asked the question, when? Now, the reason I say that is, I want to put up our chart here.
So just before the Lord's crucified, this is when he's talking about that. And he's talking about this time of wrath, the seven years that's going to come. And in the middle of the years, there's going to be abomination of desolation that's going to take place that Daniel talked about. So in, in, in Matthew 24, in verse 2, when the Lord said that all these things are going to be thrown down, and they asked the question, when? We, in talking about temples, when is Herod's temple going to be destroyed? Or, better yet, the, the real question is, when will the temple be destroyed? And I guess I, I said it wrong the first time, and it, it'll, it'll be a way to bring your attention to the fact that most people think that Matthew 24 was fulfilled in 70 A.D. when Titus the general came in and ransacked Jerusalem and, and some people, and Pastor Jordan even making a point this last taping, because I've read this before, that he actually didn't totally, he might have, I don't know if he did the same thing as Antiochus did in, in bringing an abomination into the temple, but he certainly ransacked the city and, 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 and did something, desecrated the temple. But, the, uh, but it's, it's actually years after him that there's another, the, the Jews always kept rebelling against the Roman government. That's why even in, in the book of John, the, the Pharisees worried about Christ causing a problem that's going to cause Rome to come in and destroy the city. But eventually they did come in. Rome did follow Titus's uh, entrance into the city and finally did totally demolish the temple. And so that took place in 70 A.D. up to 110, 120 A.D. And uh, the temp Herod's temple was destroyed. And when people read this passage, they always say, see, this is when the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. But I always thought to myself, wait a minute here. We're, we're, here, we're studying Bible prophecy, and in Bible prophecy, there is no understanding about an interruption of the Age of Grace. And somewhere around 35 A.D. is when Saul of Tarsus was saved and, and commissioned, and God postponed his dealings with the nation of Israel, postponed Bible prophecy, and began the dispensation of the grace of God. So, is this prophecy something that got fulfilled in the age of grace? And that's really a question a lot of times when we study Bible, because there are some things that you wonder, is there some things that were said that did get fulfilled in this time period? And I, I can find a couple, I think. Um, so, but most people, without even thinking, say, as soon as they read this passage, say, well, that's the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. But the reason I read all the way down to verse 15, they're asking, when is it going to be destroyed? And when you see an abomination of desolation in verse 15, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that's out here. That's never happened yet. And the desolation that he seems to be talking about here of the temple, it doesn't matter if it's Herod's temple or a temple that's coming in the future, there is going to be a temple that's going to be destroyed. And, uh, at, and there, there is, Herod's temple has been destroyed. In the, right now where we're living, there is no temple over in Israel. And that's a really, a, everyone always want to study that because they realize that when Bible prophecy resumes again, there's going to be a temple here. So everybody's watching for the temple to be rebuilt because if it's rebuilt, you know, like in our lifetime, we know we're getting pretty close to that. Although you have to allow, it could be rebuilt tomorrow and destroyed next week again, you know, if they could do it something that fast. It, just because it's rebuilt doesn't mean it's the end of the age of grace. It's when the Antichrist signs a treaty that begins this time period here. So we could be deceived by everyone thinking Bible prophecy being fulfilled in the age of grace. But what I wanted you to do is I wanted you to see this passage because Matthew 24 is going to lead into the very last days of Bible prophecy. And, uh, and, and this is not necessarily a reference to Titus in 70 A.D. I don't at all think it has anything to do with Titus in 70 A.D. I think that, that the way God has designed things, that it's, everything's just going to blend right together as if it's not Titus, it's the Antichrist that comes in, sets up the abomination, and gets destroyed. And all this talk about Titus is just really, uh, I think, uh, deceiving and, and, and getting people thinking Bible prophecy in the age of grace. Uh, there, there's two ways of, of showing that. Not only just what I just did to you, to, and we, I'm not going to show you the, all the verses that talk about the dispensation of grace, and it's God's purpose before the foundation of the world, and prophecy is everything that God... Uh, prophesied since the foundation of the world. Uh, the point is, is that hopefully you understand that the age of grace is an interruption in, de in Israel's program and God's doing something else that wasn't prophesied. That's the point. That's why it's called a mystery. A mystery is something kept secret. Prophecy is something made known before it happens. They're just two opposite things. 
And uh, so God's today not doing things that he made known. He's doing things that he didn't make known. But uh, go with me to the book of Hebrews first. Because even though there's this interruption in the age of grace, the Lord did prepare before he died the, the Jewish people for a destruction of the temple. And, and in that preparation, it was good prophetically for another reason. As you read the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is actually, go to chapter 10. Uh, I, I can, just from chapter 10, can give you a, a good grasp of the book of Hebrews. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. It says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they have uh, ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance, again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. But then it starts talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, um, it, down in verse 10, By the which will, the Lord Jesus Christ comes by the will of God the Father, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So point, uh, my point in the book of Hebrews is the Lord Jesus Christ is going to go and die on the cross and his blood is going to be the blood of the new covenant promised to the nation of Israel. And under the old covenant they had animal sacrifices that never did take away sins. It was just a remembrance that they needed their sins dealt with. But Jesus Christ is going to die one time for all mankind, pay for all sin, so that you don't need animal sacrifices. What, what goes on in the temple? Animal sacrifices. <laughs> the whole point is that Jesus Christ is bringing in the new covenant and the old covenant is going to go away. His blood is the provision of the new covenant. And, and so they don't need to have, a, as you go through the book of Hebrews, he, he's now the high priest. He is the one sacrifice for sin. Uh, he, 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 uh, 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 th this, this earthly tabernacle that they used to meet in was just a picture of, of the true tabernacle in heaven and that Jesus Christ, when he ascended into heaven, took his blood before God the Father, sprinkled his blood before God the Father, and God the Father is satisfied that the payment of sin is now made. Verse 14, it says, For by, by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So, so the Hebrews is preparing them for that. Um, look at verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. So the first thing to realize is that the Jewish people, under their program, are to recognize that the blood of Jesus Christ, according to the book of Hebrews, has provided them a new way to approach God. They always came to God through the temple, through the priesthood. But Jesus Christ is the high priest. He's already sprinkled his blood before God the Father. So when it says a new and living way, they got to get used to something. I mean, 1,500 years they've been doing this through the temple. Now all of a sudden, uh, they, they're going to have to approach God a new way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Uh, but when it says in verse 20, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, he's going to use a parallel. He's going to make a picture of the, the temple where they had a veil, but now his flesh is the way that the veil has been uh, done away and through Christ you can now come to God. It says in verse 21, And having a high priest, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, believing what Jesus Christ has accomplished, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our, and, and our bodies washed with pure water. And all that's symbolic in Israel, all the things that they were doing physically, now they're coming through Christ. And let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now not only is the book of Hebrews telling the Hebrew people, don't go to a temple anymore. That's been done away. That's the old system. There's a new and living way. And, and by the way, if you read through the book of Hebrews, the prime word is better. 
a better priesthood, a better sacrifice, better. To, it, it just, it, I, I just keep saying better because now there's a, a better way, and it's and it's a way that actually dealt with sin. So the reason I tell you that is not only does it tell them there's a new way, it tells them don't go back, and there's a real strong warning if they go back the other way. Um, let me just keep reading. Verse 23, Let us hold our profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another and provoke one another to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. So they're still going to meet together, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Exhorting each other to come to God the new and living way. There's going to be a temptation to go back the old way. It says, uh, uh, and not for say, uh, verse 26, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, and this, they just got the knowledge of the truth in this, past, in this book, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. You reject Jesus Christ, there is no more sacrifice for sin. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment, and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. How much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. Now that doesn't mean he trusted in it. This is a guy that, that's being tempted in this area or in, in this area here to not to come to God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, but go back to the temple sacrifices. And so to do that, he has to count the blood of Jesus Christ as an unholy thing, that he's indeed not the Son of God, that his blood didn't pay for our sins. And the blood of the covenant is the blood of the new covenant. He's got to call the blood of Jesus Christ an unholy thing and go back to the old system. If he does that, how much sore punishment, suppose ye, <laughs> that, that he, he thought worthy who hath, Un, uh, trodden underfoot the Son of uh, God, and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he is sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite the Spirit of grace. Man, that guy's in trouble, is he not? That's why those statements, uh, a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation shall devour the adversary. Those who don't come to God through Jesus Christ, they go back the other way. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. You're going to reject Jesus Christ, God the Father, you're going to fall into judgment. So there is a warning throughout the book of Hebrews, verse, verse 38. It says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. See how they got to endure the end? But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, damnation but to them that believe unto the saving of the soul. They're going to endure the end, and they're going to go into the kingdom be saved. So the book of Hebrews, so there's two things. The age of grace has interrupted Israel's program. There's no temple in here, but the temple is the believers of the body of Christ. We're the temple of God. But even in Israel's program, without the age of grace, the blood of Christ is the means by which everyone was going to come to God a new and living way according to the promise of the Old Testament, the promise of the new covenant. And when, the, when it goes back into effect, that book, the book of Hebrews is going to be a warning not to go back to the temple. Because when you come to the, the tribulation time, there is a temple there. Come to the book of Daniel, go to chapter 11. Now we are stepping over the line. We were studying fulfilled Bible prophecies. <laughs> I don't think Titus fulfilled the Bible prophecy in Matthew 24, and part of that is showing you what's going to happen in the future. So we are looking a little bit about uh, looking a little bit ahead here concerning the temples, uh, so that well, it actually brings us to the conclusion of uh, the tale of two cities. Uh, Matthew chapter, uh, Daniel chapter 11. I'm going to do this backwards. I, I looked at my notes and I thought, you know, if I do this backwards, I think it might be clearer to you. Uh, Daniel 11 is full of details about the coming of the Antichrist. And I think if I just read some verses, you can, you can see it. If you look at verse 21, it says, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person. Well, that sounds like an Antichrist coming, doesn't it? 
So it tells you all the details, those wars and rumors of wars that's going to lead up to the Antichrist. But this vile person, when you see who he is and what he's going to do, uh, certainly this is speaking about the Antichrist. It says, In his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with, a strong, and with an arm of a flood shall, shall they be overthrown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Now, when the prince of the covenant, uh, Daniel 9 already talked about a prince of the covenant, but I'm taking this backwards, so uh, the prince of the covenant is identifying him as the Antichrist. Verse 23 says, And after the league made with him, see, this last seven years begins with a treaty that's made with the prince of the covenant. That's the covenant he's referring to. It says, After the league made with him, uh, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall be strong with a small people. Uh, that, and you know, it, it, just to kind of tell you, you know, when you're looking at Bible prophecy, I'm always looking at the small nations rising up. It scares me to death. I'm not worried about Russia and big things. Uh, I'm always, whenever I see a small nation threatening things, uh, that, that I start looking and say, hmm. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm, Try not to look at Age of Grace and see fulfilled Bible prophecy, but the stage will be set either after the Age of Grace is over or just as it's concluding, whichever way it works. But anyhow, verse 24, he's going he's to, uh, we just read, uh, he's going to come uh, and shall be, uh, come strong with a small people. Verse 24, he shall enter peaceably even unto the fattest places of the providence, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among the prey and the spoil and the riches. Yea, he shall uh, forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Now, you know, a king usually doesn't spread the wealth out. This guy not only has victory, but when he has victory, he takes the, the spoils and spreads it out, passes it out. Well, the reason I'm saying that, if you just kind of follow some of the things that are said here, drop down to verse 28. It says, and he, uh, then shall he return. So he's, there's some battles that are going back and forth. Then shall he return unto his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. Now, you have to ask yourself, what's the holy covenant? Well, that had to be the new covenant, right? If it's, if it's genuinely the holy covenant, he's against the blood of Jesus Christ. He don't want the Jews to come to God through the blood of Christ. So he shall return unto the land with, a, with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. And he shall do exploits and return to his own land. He's going to do some heroic act that's against the new covenant. Now, if he's spoiling, he's passing out money, if you remember last, last week when we talked about between Zerubbabel and Herod, Herod, in order to win the Jewish influence, he, he supported, paid for the building of the temple. Now, that, that was a good thing then because God was dealing with Israel through the temple. I, I see a pattern here. The, the exploits, he's got riches, and on the way, he stops to do something against, on the way back to his land, he stops to do something against the Holy Covenant. To me, he gives them the money, to build the, new, the, the, the temple, the Antichrist, I believe that's what he's doing. Verse 29 says, At the time appointed he shall return and shall come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or the latter, for the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore shall he be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So he, he has a problem after that, and now he's, he's mad and he's going to work against the Holy Covenant, so shall he do, he shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Now that's the Jews who are being part of the temple. And they're going to help him go against the Jews that refuse the temple. And his arms shall stand up on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, uh, but, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Well, they're told, <laughs> flee, into, flee out, out of Jerusalem into the mountains. And they, shall, they that have understanding among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, by famine, by captivity, and by spoil many days. And when they shall fall, they shall be hoping a little, uh, but they shall 
uh, not, uh, the, uh, but many shall cleave unto them with flattery. So you don't, they don't know who to trust. And that matches the things that we read in Matthew 24. And those who know the truth and are trying to get out of there, they're being given up and they're being martyred. So when you look at that, you see that the Antichrist probably has a part of building that temple. Go back to chapter 9. Now, you know, you have to spend some time in detail thinking, does all that fit? But the, the, the thing that's obvious here is the Antichrist is involved in this temple. In Daniel chapter 9, in verse 26, it says, And after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. So this, is to, this told us when the Messiah was going to come, and then after three score and week, two weeks, the Messiah, one week after he rode in Jerusalem to be their king, they crucified him. That happened after that three score and two weeks. So that, that's a reference to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the Messiah being cut off, not for himself. He didn't die for himself. He died for the blood of the new covenant for them. We know he died, uh, as, the, as Paul told us, for, for our sins. So, uh, verse 26, After three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. See how I relate the city and the sanctuary together? There's a destruction coming. You have to ask yourself in verse 26, that matches Matthew 24. Did that happen in 70 AD? Well, let's say 70 AD, somewhere around here. <laughs> or is that forgetting that there's an age of grace and jumping into the tribulation? So, but it does say the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. Uh, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So there's an abomination that's going to bring a desolation. And that desolation is involved with the destruction of the city and the sanctuary. They're going to be, we can read like Revelation chapter 11, how the, the city of Jerusalem is going to be run, overrun by the Gentiles for, for uh, 42 months. That's three and a half years. So the city is going to be ransacked right in the middle of the tribulation. And the temple is going to be desecrated. Uh, uh, desecrated, but even worse than that, probably destroyed. Uh, yeah, decimated, but yeah, both are true. Anyhow, uh, verse 27, it says, And he, now remember, the people of the prince that will come is going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. Verse 27, And he, that prince that's going to come, now that's not the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Messiah the prince, but they rejected him, so there's going to be another prince that's going to come. And it says in verse 27, He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination he shall make it desolate. Even unto the consummation, and that determined, shall be poured out on the desolate. In the midst of the week, in the midst of the seven years here, he's going to cause the abomin he's going to, he's going to cause the uh, uh, the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and then to overspread his abomination, he's going to make it desolate. Well, what he does, according to 2 Timothy, chapter, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, and Revelation chapter 13, he sets an image up in that temple of himself, orders the world to worship him, receive the mark of his, the image on their right hand, and, and he goes through like a death process, and then there's no more, he, he ends their sacrifices, because he claims to be the sacrifice for sin. He sets up an image, there's an abomination, that's going to bring the desolation of the temple and total destruction. Now, all that's going to get destroyed at the second coming of Jesus Christ. So those things are about the Antichrist. I don't know if we've got time. Chapter 8, we don't really have time. Look at verse 9. It says, And out of one of them, this little horn, shall wax uh, exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, toward the present land, it shall wax great even unto the host of heaven. So this guy, he's not only just after humans, he, he's going to fight the heavenly angels. Uh, and it cast some, down, some of the host uh, of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. And he magnified himself even unto the prince of the host, and by, uh, which I would believe is Michael the archangel. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and, the ho and, and, and a host was given unto him against the daily sacrifice by reason of the transgression. 
and it cast the truth to the ground, and practiced and prospered. Then I heard one speaking, saying to another of the saint, uh, that certain saint which spake unto me, How long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary to be uh, 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 sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Two thousand three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And it will be cleansed at the second coming of Jesus Christ when he comes in and sets up his own temple when he comes back. So, uh, anyhow, you see the prophecies that are going to take you in, take them into the time of the Antichrist. I'll show you next week the temple that Jesus Christ will build when he comes back. And, uh, but you see how that's also related to the city um, being overrun and finally the city coming into its final phase through the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your Bible. It's got so much information that we'll spend our life studying it. And uh, sometimes we get some good glimpses of, of things and we can put some verses together. And other times there's times that we need to keep studying further. But we thank you that we understand where we live in the age of grace and that there is no building that you're living in today. But what a privilege we have that when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, our bodies are the temple of your Holy Ghost. And so, Father, we thank you for your oneness with us and this age of grace and the hope that we have and the information of what, of what follows. We do pray for the service following as well, that we might continue to see the revelation that you've given concerning eternal things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.